Reasonable Expectations, part three, maybe even part four. Let's dive in and let's start with the Clemson Tigers tonight. What's reasonable to expect? I think Clemson's part of that club, that 11 and one club that we talk about. Uh, there are only a few of these. But again, the rules are when you stack the kind of talent they have and when you've got the kind of track record they have, it is reasonable for that fan base, especially given the nature of Clemson's schedule every year, to expect 11 wins. Knowing they're capable of undefeated and knowing something like last year could happen. But if 9 and 3 happen or happens, you could be disappointed in that. You should be. Because your, your 9 and 3, you know, you, uh, most teams' successes would be your failures now. Clemson's preseason over-under win total is 10 and a half, so this would be an over ever so slightly here. I just ask this. I, I always get people who disagree, but you never give me reasons. So I want to ask, if you think that 11 and 1 is an unreasonable expectation for Clemson, tell me why. You can do it in the comments or the live chat here. I kind of halfway have my eye on it. There's proof I'm watching it, though. Um, you tell me why a Clemson fan should not be aggressive with their expectation level. They've got the top defensive line in the conference. They, unlike last year, have options at quarterback. They're a proven commodity. Like I said, last year was a bad year, and they still ended up winning double-digit games. I think the options at quarterback point cannot be overstated, though. See, last year, when we figured out what they were offensively, and more importantly, when the rest of the conference did, you just kind of had to throw your hands up and say, it is what it is. This year, as early as the Georgia Tech game in week one, if we find out that they're struggling offensively, I know Dabo Swinney said all the right things about DJ. He has an option, and that option had five stars next to his name in this past class, too. Cade Klubnik is there. Now, he may be a true freshman, but he's capable of a lot of things. There were some really good returns from him out of spring ball. Uh, he's a little more advanced. I, I don't think that you would use the term raw to describe Cade Klubnik. You wouldn't say seasoned, but, but I don't think he's raw and just an automatic redshirt candidate going to need a year no matter what. No, there may very well come a time this year, especially if there is offensive struggle where Cade Klubnik is that guy. And I'm telling you right now, there's a lot of experience at the quarterback position up and down the ACC, but how much top-end talent is better than the backup option there at Clemson? I don't know. Now, talent doesn't alone do what you need it to do, but they've got options there. And the next thing you also have to talk about, obviously, is the Clemson schedule. They have NC State on the schedule. Yeah, they get them at home, though. They do have to go to Notre Dame. They have a bye before that. And elsewhere, their toughest stretch is at Wake, NC State, at Boston College. And those three games, while they may qualify as the toughest stretch on Clemson's schedule, I mean, we're about to talk about Auburn in a second and Arkansas. You ask those teams how that compares to their tough stretches. Uh, that's, that's not even close to the toughest stretch that some of these teams play. So all those things considered, yes, 11-1, and one, more than reasonable for the Clemson Tigers. Speaking of the Tigers, let's shift down. Let's go through Georgia. Pick which interstate you want to use. Let's go to Lee County, Alabama. Auburn, 7-5 and five is what I'm going to call reasonable. Our buddy Parker, I never let him know. I never give him a heads up. But every now and then he stumbles upon a good point and he puts it out there publicly. So he did that today. It, it was that time of it was that time of month for Parker. I'm gonna pause so I can clip that for individual out of context use later on. Parker said, random thought, how was Auburn's 2021 real? They were six and two, then they lost five straight games that they just absolutely gave away. Then a faction of boosters tried to get the coach fired unsuccessfully, and then that coach still signed a top 25 recruiting class. How? Well, I'll tell you how. It's actually a slogan around there, and it sounds a little something like this. Because it's Auburn. That's how. If you were to pitch Auburn as a series to Netflix, they would shoot it down before I even finished that tweet because they would say, that's unrealistic. We need something that's believable. Oh, it happens. It happens around here all the time. I grew up right next to this program. I, I am intimately familiar with it, and it's, it's something that you can love it. You know, you have, to, you have to appreciate it at a certain point, or otherwise you'll just pull your hair out. You, you just, well, some of us. Some of us don't have that option. But you observe it, and it's almost like at some point you just go, just wake me up when fall gets here. You know, because like Parker said there, after all that, Harson got Tank Bigsby. He didn't transfer. You remember those rumors? Signed a top 25 class. And so now... The over-under being six wins for the Auburn Tigers this year, I'm going to tick a little bit above that, as I have most of the time with reasonable expectations. 
uh, because I always think it's reasonable, especially for major programs who have invested, to expect a little bit more than Vegas does. So I'm going to say seven and five is a reasonable expectation for an Auburn fan this year. Now, here is the, well, here's one of a couple of problems. And by a couple, I probably mean more like half a dozen. There's a saying out there, sometimes I buy into it, sometimes I don't. And that saying is, well, if you have two quarterbacks or more, you really have none. That's not always true. Sometimes you just have a lot of really good options. For instance, Texas A&M's got a couple of them right now. I think they have two quality quarterbacks, maybe three, depending on what Wegman does. I think LSU has more than one capable and quality quarterback right now. At Auburn, though, I don't know that they have that. It's a pretty anonymous quarterback room. In fact, I would say this is a pretty anonymous Auburn team. That doesn't mean anything. Some of Auburn's best teams have been anonymous in the preseason. But Zach Calzada is coming off injury, so I don't think anyone, including the coaching staff, fully knows what to expect from him. Robbie Ashford is the Oregon transfer, transferred out of Oregon for a reason. Um, I don't think that they were necessarily thrilled with what they got from T.J. Finley last year. What is Auburn at quarterback? It's an easy question. That's where you always have to start with these teams. But then you extend out beyond that. It's Tank Bigsby, and it's a pretty anonymous team. I think they like where they are at tight end. I think they look at their defensive personnel, and they think, you know, Owen Papo's a really good player. We got some guys with a lot of promise in our defensive secondary. They may be anonymous to the rest of the country, but they can take the ball away. They can get stops when we need to. My question always circles back to, especially if you play in that division, in that conference, when you play Penn State, when you play at, at Georgia, at Ole Miss, Arkansas, A&M, Alabama, the list goes on and on. It's that way every year with this team. What kind of edges do you have in these games? You cannot out-scheme people in this league if you don't have at least comparable personnel, if you can't get yourself in the same ballpark personnel-wise. You have to have edges somewhere. You have to have something that you can leverage to exploit. And with Auburn, you know, when I look at Georgia – or I look at them playing Alabama, you can lose those two games and have a respectable season. But then we get another level deep, and we talk about Arkansas coming in there, at Ole Miss, Penn State early in the year will obviously be the first big test for them. I think seven and five is pretty aggressive. I think I'm being aggressive saying seven wins. Now, I know the expectation level down there is different than that. That's why this segment's called reasonable expectation. Seven and five is the highest I can go here. Uh, Tank Bigsby, if he has a career year, Tank Bigsby could be an all-SEC running back, and that only be good enough for 7-5. and five. If you want to sell me on a number higher than that, I'll be happy to listen, but it's got to be something that's based in, in more than just, just smoke and mirrors. Uh, you don't smoke and mirrors your way to more than seven wins with the schedule they have to play and adding Penn State and out-of-conference for good measure. Uh, let's go to the Big 12 here. A lot of changes happening all over the place. That includes Norman, Oklahoma. Oklahoma's over under win totals nine and a half at most books. I think nine and a half is pretty much the number across the board. They went 11 and two last year. Now you know about all the transition out with Lincoln Riley, in with Brent Venables. They get a good tune up opportunity this year. So they got, uh, who is it, UTEP and Kent State coming in. Now you see the over under win total there on the screen. So nine and a half. Now most of these, I have gone a little bit over the total to define reasonable expectations. But I actually went a little bit under here. I think it is reasonable for Oklahoma fans to expect nine wins. Hope for more, but the reasonable expectation is nine wins. Because after that opening set of games against UTEP and Kent State, look at the next four. You know, there's, no, there's no time, in other words, if you're wobbly in that game at Nebraska, which is not a, a crazy concept with a first-year staff and a first-year head coach in town, if you're wobbly at Nebraska... There's no let up. Kansas State is a very much a dark horse team in the Big 12 this year. Then they go to TCU the next week. Then they got Texas and Dallas the week after that. There is no even, even semblance of an ability to work on anything or you know, maybe let your guard down until the Kansas game, and that's a month later. And so I picture it going a couple of ways. Either Oklahoma has not dropped off and the overall talent level in the locker room along with a more seamless transition than maybe a lot of people expected, leads them to go 3-1 and one or better through that stretch. If that happens, they're off to the races. Because once you get halfway into the season, you're probably not wobbly anymore, unless injury hits you hard. We know what Oklahoma under Brent Venables is going to be in 2022 by that point. And if they get there, yeah, we can redefine this. I'm looking at that four-game stretch at Nebraska, Kansas State, at TCU, Texas. Oklahoma fans could sell themselves on winning every one of those games. 
they may be favored in every one of those games. What I'm saying is they are all also losable. There is a path there. So if we're working in the law of percentages, in the world of percentages, I have to look at that and figure, yeah, there may be a stumbling block in there somewhere. And then down the stretch, it's at Iowa State, Baylor, at West Virginia, Oklahoma State, at Texas Tech. These are just, I know they're all winnable. That's the big trick. It's the same thing with USC, ironically. That's where Lincoln Riley went. You look at Southern Cal's schedule. Every one of those games looks winnable. Oklahoma, every one of those games looks winnable. That's the trick in this whole schedule formulation and, and reasonable expectation argument. It, you notice on this show, we do not go up and down the list and go, that's a win, that's a win, there's a loss, that's a win. I just don't think there's skill in that. Guys, there's hardly any skill in that the week of the game. You think I'm about to sit here and tell you what Oklahoma Baylor's going to look like on November 5th? I have no clue what I'm going to look like on November 5th. I certainly don't know what the roster situations are going to be like there, whether we've had starters uh, alternate, whether we've had depth chart upheaval, whether a team's just underperformed, whether weather's going to be a factor. Who in the world knows? Nine and three, I think, is reasonable to expect for Oklahoma. And then anything more than that, well, we're probably sitting here in December touting Brent Venables as a coach of the year candidate. Alabama, one of the most high-profile programs in the country, but this will be one of the shortest segments that we do because Alabama is the same number every year. Alabama, Georgia, Clemson, Ohio State, they're all 11 and 1. 11 and 1 is the reasonable expectation. That's kind of where you, you set your baseline expectation level every single year. I know Bama fans want to go undefeated. I'm saying 11 and 1 is reasonable. Now, you may think to yourself, ooh, 11 and 1, that, that means he thinks they're going to lose a game. No, I think it's reasonable to suggest they may drop one. Do you understand how good you have to be to have Bama schedule this year and still have this be the reasonable expectation? Their over-under win total is 11, by the way. So this is kind of right in line with what odds makers think. Their road schedule is tough, and it won't be acknowledged because we're talking about Alabama, and people kind of in their subconscious, they have a different standard of how they define tough for the good teams, i.e., if you were taking Miami and you made them go to Texas and then home against Arkansas or no, no, you got to go to all these places at Texas, at Arkansas, at Tennessee, at LSU, at Ole Miss, or have Michigan do that. You know, have, have Oregon do that. Do you understand how big a deal that would be? Just rule of the show. If you know me, if you claim to be a friend of mine and you are calling me during the show, you are getting deleted out of the eye, Josh. We continue. That road stretch is brutal. It will be overlooked, like I said, because it's Bama. And so people assume they're going to win every game. Uh, you know, they went into College Station as a three-touchdown favorite last year. Does anyone remember? I do. You know where I was during that game. I was not where I should have been. And so even with that, though, Bryce Young is back there. Uh, that's the best quarterback in the country. You'll have a lot of debate about C.J. Stroud. If you gave me C.J. Stroud as a backup option, I would not be upset. I'm just saying one of them won the Heisman last year. You're looking at the one in Crimson here. Uh, he's got a very deep stable of tailbacks. You've got the best pass rush in America. you got, to me, the two best edge rushers in America on the same team. And they've got a very, very veteran, seasoned, talented secondary. There are so many blinking green arrows on Alabama that even with that road schedule, you still find a way to say it's reasonable, 11 and 1. I guess that wasn't as short as I thought it would be. Community. Uh, moving on, let's go to Arkansas. This is the one I struggled with the most. I spent like probably 30 minutes on Arkansas today, kind of because I wanted to, and kind of because it's tough to figure this out. Arkansas has got a brutal schedule too. They do every year. It's kind of a, I think it's a state law in Arkansas. They have to have one of the five toughest schedules in America. The schedule may be brutal, but I'm not flinching. Nine and three is a reasonable baseline expectation for Arkansas this year, which, as you can see, differs greatly. The preseason over-under win total in Vegas is seven. I'm going to tell you why that is. Because this schedule is, is it's broken glass, and Arkansas may be barefoot. Who knows? They have a schedule that really harkens back to one of our famous, or one of our favorite sayings. I don't know how famous it is. It's one of our favorite sayings on the show. Uh, one of the big lies in college football is you are what your record says you are. The actual rule is sometimes you are what your schedule dictates you are. And right now, you can just know that they play in the SEC West and know they've got a tough schedule. But then when I tell you they've got Cincinnati for good measure, they go to Brigham Young. They're traveling to Provo, Utah 
for an out-of-conference game the week after. Here, here's, here's the stretch. They play A&M in Dallas. Then they play Bama at home. Then they go to Mississippi State. Then they go to Provo, Utah. There's no bye week in there. That's back to back to back to back. Madness, uh, but they're going to do it anyway. Arkansas uh, will have the fastest defense you have seen them have this year. I know they are thrilled. They are lit up with the potential of that defense up there. Uh, we are big Barry Odom guys on this show. Big Barry Odom guys. That's the defensive coordinator for those unfamiliar there at Arkansas. I think that even with that challenge, you have to remember something. Because you can kind of get caught up in looking at strength of schedule. And, and we look at it a lot on this show. But what you have to sell your team on, which Sam Pittman won't struggle at all with, is you don't play a schedule on Saturday. You play one team on a Saturday. So when you face off against Ole Miss, you're not playing LSU and A&M and Bama. It's just Ole Miss on that day. It's just Alabama. I know that's a mouthful, but it's just A&M come September 24th. It's only a game at Auburn the 29th of October. No more, no less. And the fact of the matter is, including the Bama game, since it's in their building, they're going to think they're capable of winning every game. And I, at the very least, think they're capable of competing in every game. So 9-3, and three, I know it differs. It is totally detached from what the Vegas reality says Arkansas is. I think they're that good a team. 9-3 and three this year I think is reasonable.